Okay. Afternoon, everyone. Today we have our UX designers from GovTech just to share with you a little bit about designing for public good. Lah. Okay. Uh, my name is Derek and I'm also a UX designer. So today I'm going to be helping to moderate and answer some of the questions that you have. And also, um, more importantly, actually, uh, we have our two speakers here today, Shana and Timmy. Our two awesome speakers will share a little bit more to you about their work that they're doing in GovTech. Lah. So before we begin, uh, a little bit of like live chat adequate, lah, okay? Uh, kindly bring yourselves um, and also switch off your camera throughout the live chat. Lah. Okay, we don't want weird things to happen while we are sharing stuff, okay? And if you have any questions, right, do leave your questions to the end. You can actually ask the questions using the chat function. Lah. You probably send to some of the hosts that we will see and then we will answer your questions later. And note that this live chat, right, will actually be recorded and it'll be uploaded on our YouTube channel on a later date, lah. So just to share what today will be like, right? We will have a little bit of like the introductions first, followed by sharing by Shane and Timmy. Then our each our team will share a little bit more about the career opportunities with GovTech, followed by a Q and A session at the end before we close off the session today, lah. So just to share a little bit more about the people who are giving you the sharing today, right? Okay, first up we have Shana. She is currently a UX designer on the Our Singapore Grants Portal. Uh, and secondly, we have Timmy, right, who's actually on the adaptive learning system. Uh. So these are actually two very separate projects in GovTech. Our Singapore Grants Portal is more of a delivery-based project, whereas adaptive learning system is more of a project which we are providing strategy for our stakeholders. Uh, okay, so without further ado, probably I'll let them share a little bit more about themselves and their project. So maybe Shana can blow your way. Hi, everyone. Uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know. Yeah, as Derek has introduced, I'm Shayna, and I'm a UX designer here at GovTech. Um, so maybe let me just share a little bit about myself before I get into uh, the sharing. Um, my background is in product and in communication design. And before I joined GovTech, I was a service designer in the healthcare sector. So over there, I did a lot of process improvement work to enhance the experiences and workflows in the hospital, for example, looking at how to reduce waiting time when you're there for appointments and how to make the overall experience better for patients and staff. Yeah, so we were on the ground a lot, as you can see in the pictures, speaking to people to understand their pain points for us to design better solutions. Yeah, and outside of work, something I like to do for fun is making chocolates. Um, I say that I do this because it's another creative outlet for me. But okay, the real reason is that I just wanted to have a good reason to eat a lot of chocolate. And now I can say that I do it in the name of iteration and testing. So that's great. Yeah, now, aside from that, I also like to do other projects that allow me to give back to the community. Um, one of the projects that I started with a group of friends is called Visual Aid. Um, we launched it in 2020 during the height of COVID-19 when there was a surge in migrant uh, cases in migrant worker dormitories. So at that time, there were two big challenges, language barriers and the huge volume of patients that needed screening. So firstly, it's hard to describe your symptoms when you don't even speak the same language. Um, for example, when you point to your chest and you say, oh, pain, is it your chest that is hurting or is it your lungs? Um, secondly, when there are over 500 over patients flooding your door every day, um, you don't really have the luxury of time. So triaging patients needed to be quick, but it also needed to be accurate. So we saw an opportunity here to do something to help this situation. And our solution was simple. We created a series of visual cue cards and we made them available for healthcare workers to print and use during triaging to bridge these communication gaps. Um, and because visuals are quickly and universally understood. You don't have to do any more gesturing and wondering about whether or not we're both talking about the same thing. So this helped to make triaging much swifter and more accurate for nurses and doctors. And after we launched it, it became quite widely shared and was eventually adopted by healthcare frontliners from several hospitals and community facilities. And that's basically the story of how a bunch of designers were able to play a tiny part in supporting our healthcare workers in a time of crisis. So today's topic of designing for public good is really something that resonates very strongly with me because I truly believe that design is a very powerful tool that can be used to solve all sorts of problems. 
Um, and the solution can be so, so simple. Like this was not a fancy solution by any measure. Uh, it's actually quite rudimentary, but a simple solution can be very impactful if you're designing and solving the right problems. Yeah, so that's me. And today I'm going to be sharing a bit more about life here in GovTech and how we design for public good here as UX designers. Um, but before I go into that, let me first introduce GovTech to those of you who may not be too familiar with what we do. So fundamentally, we are an IT consulting and delivery arm of the government. And you might know us best from some of our famous products like Trace Together, SingPass, and the Go Air series. Um, and I'm sure most of us will be familiar with at least some of these products. But what we have here at GovTech are not just the public-facing products that you see, but a whole suite of them that most people wouldn't hear about. And that's because most of our products are built for supporting government agencies behind the scenes. For example, building platforms that help ministries to bolster their fraud detection capabilities. Um, for myself, the product that I'm working on is called RSG Grants Portal, which I'll share more about later. So one thing in common that all these products have is that they're all solutions for public good. For me, um, if it's not already obvious, I've always been drawn to that sort of work and to companies that serve with heart. And that's really one of the reasons why I joined GovTech Lab, because I find that the work that we do here is meaningful and it's really purposeful to me. So for those of you here who are also interested in that sort of work and want to know what it's like getting hired here, let me share what the interview process is like. So maybe some of you here are graduating soon or maybe are really in the process of looking for jobs. And if you're not this guy, um, you would know that when you apply, you always got to have two things, your CV and your portfolio. So once the company reviews these items and they think it might be a good fit for the role, they'll call you in for an interview. Now, there are three main parts to GovTech's interview process. Part one is really just a casual chat to get to know you and for you to get to know the team, kind of to see if everyone can work well together. Um, part two is when you share more about your work and your portfolio so that the team can understand more about your design process. So this part is quite fun because you get to share more about your work. Some teams combine this portion with the casual chat, so it's really up to how individual teams want to do it. And if everything is good and you make it to part three, this is where you're usually given a whiteboard challenge or a take-home challenge to evaluate your skill set and for the team to see how you approach problem solving. And if you make it through all of these stages, then congrats, you're officially hired and welcome to the team. <laughs> now, when you get hired into GovTech, you get hired to work on a particular product. So our setup as designers follows more of a decentralized model where designers are put in teams across different GovTech products. So basically what that means, right, is that if I'm interviewed by the Trace Together team, when I join, I'll join Trace Together and I'll work on Trace Together methods as a designer. For me, as I mentioned, I work on RSG Grants Portal or OSG for short. Yeah, so OSG, is essentially a one-stop platform that consolidates grants in the community and social sector into one space. Um, we've developed it in partnership with MCCY, the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth. Um, and you can think of OSG as kind of like an Expedia or a Skyscanner, but for grants, where you can search, apply and manage all your grants in one space. Now, previously before OSG existed, there were many government agencies that were giving out their own grants. So if you are an applicant, you'd have to go to all the different agency sites to search and apply for a grant that would be most suitable for your cause. And that's a lot of work they have to do. Um, and what we did on OSG was to consolidate all these various grants onto one portal. Um, and today we currently support 37 grants across 13 government agencies. And we've also helped to streamline administrative and business processes um, for government officers so that we can help make their work easier too. Um, and doing this is not exactly as straightforward as it sounds because the business processes and needs for different agencies can vary quite a bit. Um, the challenge is in designing them to all work on the same platform, but that's the kind of work that our team here uh, does on OSG. Now, our team is made out of many different roles that work together to make our product. So there are UX designers, people like myself and Derek, uh, there are delivery managers who handle the business requirements and manage scope. There are developers who build the product, 
quality engineers who test the product and DevOps engineers who maintain our infrastructure. And how we're organized is that we're not just part of a design team, but uh, where we work with other UX designers, right? But we're also part of an agile squad that has all these other team functions, like developers, delivery managers, so on. And a bunch of these agile squads make up our larger development team, made out of different squads, but all on the same product. So as you can see by now, as a designer, you never work in a silo. Now, let me just take you through what we do here on a day-to-day -day basis. And contrary to what some people might think, uh, designers do more than waste post-its all day, like in this photo. I mean, okay, we only do that sometimes now, like in this photo. Okay, so 9 a.m. is when we start off the day by answering emails and getting breakfast. Um, if we're in the office, sometimes we have treats, so that's always fun. Uh, I personally believe that it's never too early to have dessert, and ice cream for breakfast is definitely a, a great idea. After we are full and ready to go, we kick off our day uh, with our daily stand-up. So we work in an agile environment, and this is just one of our scrum ceremonies. Uh, we do this with the whole development team to update each other on what we're working on and if there's anything we need help with so that everyone can plan accordingly. Um, then we usually just start doing our own work. So as designers, we usually have design-related activities that we do throughout our day, but I'll talk more about that later. After doing some work, of course, you get hungry. So um, at 12 is when we have our lunch breaks. So sometimes we have pizza parties. Uh, sometimes we go out for lunch as a team. Uh, if we are not too full from uh, ice cream, but we try to get a good break so that we are recharged for the afternoon. Um, and after lunch is when we have our next bunch of meetings. Uh, if it's a review day, we'll have our spring reviews and spring ceremonies, which are more scrum ceremonies. But basically it's for us to show our stakeholders what we've built over the sprint um, and for them to give us their comments. Um, for spring retrospectives, we reflect on what went well during the sprint, what didn't go so well and things that puzzle us so that we're constantly refining and improving our process. And the whole squad is involved in this. At 3 p.m., sometimes we have our planning meetings so that we can discuss what we will be doing in the next sprint and delegate tasks accordingly. And after that is when we do our design sync-ups and design activities, which I'll share more in detail later when I go through our UX process. But this is also time for us to do our own work or have design-related discussions with the rest of the UX team. Now, 5 p.m. is fun because it's when we sometimes have our community events or team building activities. So remember earlier, I mentioned that designers are scattered across different product teams. Uh, yeah, but once in a while, we gather all the designers across teams to do sharings and to learn from one another. So these kind of gatherings, I, I find always quite productive and quite fun. Yeah. And finally, at 6 p.m. Uh, is go home time. So sometimes as a team, we have dinners together on special occasions. So the culture here is really one that prioritizes good relationships between teammates, being happy and looking at how we can support each other to do better in our own teams. Now, because we are designers, we also have many design activities that we do in our day. Um, they really vary from day to day, but whenever we bring on a new agency onto our portal, we go through the full design process, which I think most of you should be familiar with. Um, discover, define, develop, deliver. And these design activities are usually interspersed throughout our day. So now, for example, recently we've been looking to bring on a new agency on board our, uh, our platform. And to get to know this agency's needs and their users better, we started off by conducting a series of interviews with both their grant administrators, the people who are giving out grants, and the grant applicants, the people receiving these grants. So earlier I talked about the value of solving the right problem and research is when you really get to dig deep into the problem space to identify the right things or the most valuable things to target. After that, we conducted a series of workshops to build a common understanding and alignment with our stakeholders. So this is important because it ensures that we are all moving in the same direction and towards the same goals. Um, our development team also conducts trainings with our stakeholders when we first begin to engage them. This is to induct them into the way that we work, our approach, our culture, so that again, expectations are aligned and we're able to have a good working relationship moving forward. Now, after doing that, we do several rounds of synthesis to consolidate our learnings and begin to prioritize the problems and pain points that we want to target. So in this case, we found out that the way this agency sends out their grant awards and their contracts is through email. 
And we learned from our users that this makes it very hard to locate the documents and keep track of these documents. So this was quite a big pain point for them. And one thing we wanted to do was to help this agency to digitalize and possibly even automate the generation of these grant contracts and awards through our portal. So we mapped out their current workflow and we thought about how we can redesign it to work on our system. And we do this for both the happy and unhappy parts. And this is to make sure that we cover for all the different situations that may occur. Doing this also helps us to visualize and point out to our stakeholders parts of their process that might need to change um, and some trade-offs they might need to be aware of. Uh, for example, if we auto-generate your grant award, um, what this means for your agency is that you probably might need to standardize certain things in your contracts for us to be able to do this, which might be a trade-off that you need to accept for automation to happen. Um, then we begin to refine our solutions and to make our wireframes. So we always want to see if we are able to use components that we've already built to save development time and effort. Um, but if we need to build new things, uh, here's when we start to think about how we can design something that will be scalable and usable on our platform. At this point, we'll also have discussions with the developers on the technical feasibility on certain solutions. And during these discussions, right, sometimes they'll point out things that we didn't cater for um, and we'll work with them to fill in these gaps. So when all is good and well, we finally do a hi-fi version and hand it off to our developers to build. And of course, when all of that is done, it is important to test it to see how your users are actually using your product. So we always get our stakeholders to try the product or feature before it goes live. Um, from there, you continue to iterate and you continue to enhance uh, the feature and the product. So with that, that essentially summarizes our day and our process as designers. And I really hope that was helpful in giving everyone some insight into the things we do and how we do them. And I just want I want to wrap up this segment with some key learnings and final advice to you guys from my time here. And the first thing is, uh, as a designer, learning to balance design trade-offs is key. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many people behind a product, all with different needs and goals. And I know that as UX designers, we're meant to be advocates for our users. So this may be hard to swallow, but sometimes we can't always have the best and most ideal user experience. We need to be able to find a balance between between what the business needs, what is technically feasible, and what is a sufficiently good user experience to come up with a solution that lives in the intersection between of these three parts. Yeah, so you may not eventually end up with what you have in mind to be the most ideal UX, but I've learned that it's about making the right design trade-offs and knowing what can and cannot be compromised. Next is that having good relationships with your stakeholders can really go a long way. Um, being on this team, I've seen firsthand what a good working relationship with your stakeholders can do for a product. Because actually there are many things around product development that hinge on policy. Um, but because everyone has really invested a lot of time and effort in building a good relationship with each other, there is alignment and there is trust. And this has allowed us to foster a culture of collaboration. And the result of that is that our product is not built from a top-down approach but through an equal partnership with our product owners. And sometimes when our team faces certain red tape, um, we're able to work together to push for the necessary change required to support a better experience on our portal, um, with our product owners actually being the ones driving change on a policy level to help streamline processes and improve development work. So that's really great. And finally, this one may not be easy, but every once in a while, step out of your comfort zone. So I always have this mental image that leaving your comfort zone is like getting out of bed on a Monday morning. Like nobody wants to do it. It's tough, I know, but it's necessary. And I find that what makes it easier is when you have a mindset of being excited and curious to learn about new problems and then actively going out to seek the answers to them and looking for opportunities to apply the things that you've learned. Okay, and I can't speak for the rest, but I mean, to be very honest, doing this sharing is definitely outside my comfort zone. But we all felt that it's important uh, for us to give back to the design community. And that's why we're here. And it also kind of forces us to reflect on our learnings and during our time here. So it was personally very helpful for me. So thank you all for listening and for this chance to speak to all of you. And that 
closes off my segment for today. And now I'll just hand the time over to Timmy. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Shana. All for like props to stepping out of your comfort zone. I think you did great. <laughs> yeah, um, everyone can hear me, right? I think it's good. All right. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, my name is Tishan. That's my given name by my parents. Um, but I'm better known by my colleagues and friends as Chimmy. And um, like everyone else here, I'm very happy to be here to share with you a little bit more on my day-to-day -day as a UX designer in GovTech. Um, so there would be some overlaps uh, with what I share um, with Shana, because I think in terms of processes, there are some things that are similar. But um, the reason why I'm here is to also show that there are other forms of UX um, design within GovTech. So um, first thing first, uh, who am I? Today I work as a UX designer um, and I'm currently working in a field of AI and education technology, um, which is something that I will elaborate more in a short bit. Um, but on the side, I don't make chocolates, um, not such a fun hobby, but I also teach and advocate for design. Um, and though this is not a conversation for today as well, um, I also have an art practice on the side um, as the sculptor Chimishimi. So like many people in this field, um, I did not really start as a UX designer, but I found my way here after like a mishmash of work experiences. So I graduated from school with a visual communications background um, and spent a couple of years working in the creative arts and cultural sectors, um, working primarily in exhibition, in print, in publication and things like that. So mostly visual graphic um, sort of work, but it was sort of through the years of like jumping from one design project to another that gave me the opportunity to really think about what design is to me um, and what kind of designer I strive to become. So working in a creative industries can be you know extremely exciting um, but for me there was always this hunger and appetite to go beyond creating beautiful things uh, but also something that is useful and good for the people who use them. Um, so that is how I eventually found my way into the world of UI UX um, and uh, as the practice really aligns to my beliefs and principles as a designer and um, it was quite easy to feel right at home in this um, industry. So I actually worked in a digital consultancy prior to joining GovTech um, and had the best opportunity to really learn from great mentors, um, peers and clients. So I think usually when I tell people of my background that like I came from a consultancy and now I am in GovTech, um, often I get a question of like, oh, what is the reason for your switch um, from an agency to a public sector? So I thought this is actually quite a good space to address it because maybe some of you are thinking the same. Um, I'm trying not to give the most cliche answer possible to this question, um, but it's probably in the title of this talk, actually. <laughs> so I do come, um, it really comes from the aspiration to use tech for public good um, and to first and foremost help the citizens and the communities that um, we live with um, and live in. But this is like not saying that agencies do not help people. They probably work on products that help people too. Um, but agencies can sometimes be too expensive to hire on the long haul. And as a result, sometimes projects that you work within consultancies or agencies, they can feel very touch and go. Um, and you don't always get to see the work being actualized, uh, which can be quite a pity. So being in GovTech actually allows me to find, um, to be better embedded within product teams, um, which uh, in all, it gives me the room to be more rigorous and more in-depth um, in the answers that we seek and the solutions that we create. So the relationships we have with our stakeholders is also less of a designer versus client relationship, um, but a partnership that is built on trust um, and working towards the same goal for the people. So I think in a way, um, it allowed me to find a sweet spot uh, between what I strive to do and for the people that I believe in doing good work for. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why I'm here today. I'm a member of the ESD team, the Experience Strategy and Design team within GovTech, working with MOE um, on the AI Adaptive Learning System. So in a nutshell, my team and I are looking at the many ways in which an adaptive platform can enhance and personalize learning pathways for students. Um, although it also comes with a greater aspiration to help motivate and empower um, students to actually self-direct their own learning in the future. Um, that is a far away goal, but of course, like we are taking small steps towards that. 
So um, although we do work with a much larger team um, from MOE consisting of technologists, um, product owners, learning designers, teachers, AI engineers, etc. It's a huge team. Um, but my working team within GovTech is a small but um, not any less delightful one. So a huge mention to the two members that are not speaking, um, Leon as well as Nicolette, um, who has left bulk of her good work in my hands. So I really hope to do justice to the work that um, we have done. Um, so we were engaged by a team in MOE to help uncover how the ALS can support teaching and learning. Um, but when it comes to designing for learning, right, a lot of people would just argue that like MOE actually has all the expertise they require. So why exactly are they hiring um, UX designers um, to be part of this project? So as researchers, um, interaction and service designers, the work that we do um, is not just about building the platform as it is, um, but understanding the why and how the platform should be designed before it is actually built. I think like just to bring back what China has said um, around solving the right problems, I think this is very much in a similar grain. So um, it is not just for us to like focus on the platform as it is, um, but to figure out how the system would sort of fit in the bigger picture of teaching and learning. So it's not just about looking at the AI system itself, but to understand the whole ecosystem of teaching. And in a way, it is not for us to like sort of throw out a hundred ideas or much less to execute them, um, but to fundamentally understand how teachers teach how students learn, and in all that, um, how does the AILS actually support this ecosystem of learning? Um, so to emphasize this point, right, UX design can take many, many forms, um, but its value is really not just in the act of building and delivering tangible services and products, even though that's a huge part of it. Um, but sometimes the work can also lie in understanding how people behave and what they really need um, in order to uncover some of the real opportunities to inform how products should be built in the first place. And um, basically, that's the kind of work that we do um, and the kind of work that we believe in. Um, so I was asked actually to share a little bit about my day to day. Um, this is actually really hard to capture as it really depends on which phase of the project um, we are in. Um, but I'll just go through it. It's, it's basically the process that Shana also went through, but there are certain nuances that might be a bit different. Um, so let's begin with research. So in Nicolette's good hands, right, um, the project has actually gone through several robust research phases um, from exploratory to evaluative research. But in our team, we actually utilize um, more qualitative and generative methods, um, such as classroom observations, um, understanding learning behaviors, peer to peer dynamics, um, teaching approaches in class, etc. Um, but again, like we also understand that learning does not only take place during school hours. So uh, methods like diary studies provide us a glimpse of what motivates children to learn after school hours. And if they are not motivated, which is, I guess, majority of the children, um, why and why not? Um, so using interviews and focus group discussions also allow us that kind of quality face time with both teachers and students to deepen our understanding into their teaching and learning environments. So um, in a way, like uh, diving deeper into their day-to-day -day challenges as well as aspirations for how their ideal um, classroom would look like. So usually after the research space, um, there is always uh, a week or more of synthesis. And this actually refers to the act of making sense of the data that we have collected. Um, so a significant part of qualitative research work is not being able to just collect the data and play it back like a recording device, um, but really taking the time to go beyond the surface to uncover um, what are the deeper hidden human needs. And um, this is especially important in exploratory work um, that we do when we have to navigate through a lot of ambiguity. Um, but for everyone who has ever worked with Nick, um, you would know that she's like absolute ace in catching in um, a lot of these things and very astute in this phase of work. So usually like um, I just have to have to work on some of the insights that were created. So every now and then um, we also have to do workshops, um, all types of them, from visioning to ideation to prioritization, um, depending on the need at that point. So um, we workshop often because the nature of our work just requires us to bring together voices of stakeholders, of experts, of users. And uh, workshops are actually a very effective way to not just align um, all the different voices, but also to create um, clear, actionable next steps that we can take. 
of course, like with the clearer goals and the needs defined, um, this puts us in a good place to start generating and testing out concepts. So we often go through like rounds and rounds of concept generation, testing and iteration. Um, and uh, early concepts are usually tested with sketches and blank boxes um, as we believe in like building upwards. So refining the fidelity with each round of testing actually helps to ensure that the team doesn't get too attached to concepts early on um, and also stay open to feedback, which allows us to iterate um, quickly, boldly, and as often as possible before some of the stronger ideas are um, eventually finalized. So people are usually um, quite curious, like in such research and strategy roles, right? How your deliverables actually look like? We get that question very, very often. So as we do not deliver um, screens or ship products directly to end users, um, some of this work that we do becomes a little bit difficult to quantify um, or to measure. But for us, deliverables actually come in the form of insight decks, um, design experience principles, as well as interactive proof of concepts. Mainly, um, these deliverables serve as important artifacts to help anchor the product's purpose um, and mainly to help product teams design with the user's voice in mind so that as um, things get very uh, hectic, they don't lose sight of the user's voice. So um, for products like the adaptive learning system um, that has very little models out there to emulate and on top of the public's concern around learning safety, AI ethics, um, this becomes exceptionally important, um, not just about designing it, but how do you design it right. So our work actually helps our stakeholders understand the user's sentiments, um, which then helps to anticipate and reduce risk of building the wrong things from the beginning, um, or wasting time, wasting effort or money building features that do not add value to the overall experience. So whatever risk, um, we try our best to flag it out early and sort of like redirect um, things uh, in the right path. So we usually um, hand these concepts uh, off to bigger teams of uh, designers, developers, engineers, working with MOE and then helping them in the design translation. So um, as an example, quite recently, we finished a round of pilot studies observations um, launched in our partner schools. And um, although the platform is still in its very, very early days, um, it's really like watching a child trying to crawl, um, but being able to see students and teachers interact with the product is an extremely fulfilling one, even though there are a lot of things that still can be improved. Um, so our next steps is really to go through what we have observed during the studies and then to find opportunities to iterate um, and improve the system. So UX strategy, the thing about it is that it's often like misunderstood as like fluffy, useless, um, or work that comes free of charge um, from like the bigger idea of what is product design. Um, but I would want to emphasize that this is actually really far from the truth. Because often in government, um, we are working with teams of brilliant, well-intended um, policy makers who want to help people. They have the heart to help people. But being further away from the ground can make them lose sight of what is the real day-to-day -day challenges faced by their users. So our job as designers um, is to work within this intersection and sort of bridge the user needs to the vision of the stakeholders um, while understanding the capabilities of the technical teams that are building it. So this actually ensures that what eventually goes into build um, is not just feasible and vis um, viable in the long run, um, but it's also desirable to the very people that it was designed for. So with the AI ALS project, um, we have been extremely lucky to have found a team that understands one another's strengths and values. Um, it is really not easy working with multiple stakeholders, um, but it really helps that we are of then um, more often than not building towards a common goal that we all want to achieve together. So our setup actually allows us, um, um, SESD, allows us a good distance from our stakeholders to remain neutral and to always put the user's voice first, um, yet being embedded deep enough to push for change and to shift mindsets towards one um, that puts users in the heart of innovation. So that is the, the reason why the setup sort of um, makes it very effective for us. So one of my design mentors um, a long time ago actually told me uh, UX is not about just making a good thing. Um, it's about doing the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing is not always very obvious. And um, this is like a word of wisdom, well, a sentence of wisdom that I've always helped close to my heart. And um, although this is a lesson that I'm still learning and getting better at every day, um, I thought this sums up what my role and aspiration as a designer in GovTech is about. Um, so yeah, I hope sharing this will inform you 
um, what it means to be a UX designer in GovTech, um, maybe another perspective of what it means to be a UX designer in GovTech, um, and hopefully it would inspire to inspire you as well um, to join us. So with this, I would end my presentation and hand it over back to Derek. Okay, thank you, Shane and Timmy, for sharing your experiences. Um, we'll actually pass the time to Kelly. She's going to share a little bit more about career opportunities uh, within GovTech. La, so you can learn more about some of the fresh grad programs and some of the like not so fresh programs that we have. So yeah, passing the time to Kelly. Thanks, Derek. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Kelly from People and Organization Division, uh, which is HR in short. Regarding career opportunities, okay, so these are our young talent programs that we have for uh, students from JC, Poly, and University. So mainly the four main programs that we run is Smart Nation Scholarship, the Technology Associate Program, Geek Out, and Internship. So uh, let me go through them one by one. For internship, um, internship is actually open to uh, anyone who, who wants to have like a technical or, or corporate or business role in GovTech. So you can actually do an internship with us from three months, six months, eight months, up to one year. So we're quite flexible in the duration, but we do require interns to commit a minimum of three months so that you have a meaningful experience learning. Yeah, a meaningful experience um, learning from the mentors that, uh, that you're interacting with. Okay, so in terms of um, the whole internship program, other than the technical mentoring that you will get from um, working on the hands-on nationwide project and interacting with your direct reporting officer, you will also have um, other development opportunities that were planned by HR, for instance, the technical uh, the brown bag sessions, which is like a workshop on um, tech topics and also professional skills. We also have... Uh, volunteering opportunities, uh, career clinics, as well as a closing ceremony where we invite all the interns together to just celebrate the good work that the interns have done for us. So um, internship applications is currently opened. Uh, you can apply up to 30th of September. That's the last date of applications. And this is actually for interns who are able to start next year in the month of January, February, March, or April. So if you are looking for summer internship, we have a second round of application, which will start in um, February to March next year. Okay, so do visit the link if you want to find out more about internship or if you want to apply. So moving on, um, Smart Nation Scholarship. So Smart Nation Scholarship is open to anyone, um, whether you are a JC graduate, a poly graduate, or even if you are undergraduate, as long as you are um, not in the final year of study, you can apply for our Smart Nation Scholarship. This is a tri-agency scholarship. Um, the agencies that are participating are CSA, GovTech, and MDA. So our scholarship benefits includes um, fully paid tuition and other compulsory fee, option to backdate for midterm scholars, living allowance, one-time settling in allowance. Um, and of course, you will need uh, to be bonded to the organization for, for overseas um, program. It will be a six-year bond. And if it's a local um, scholarship, it will be a four-year bond. Okay, next up is for experienced hires. So if you are no longer a fresh graduate, uh, or if you have experience working, you can actually directly apply for our UX roles by scanning this QR code. So you just filter by agency, um, GovTech, and then you can search UX. There's actually a whole list of UX roles that are available for you to apply. So the three listed here is just some sample of what the UX uh, job title will be like. So do just check out the, the link um, to apply directly for the UX positions. Okay, so now I'll pass the time back to Derek on the Q&A. Uh, hi everyone. So if you have any questions, please do leave in the chat. The first question from Rio. So she's asking about um, do we need to have strong programming background and are we able to apply for UI UX jobs? Uh, maybe Timmy, you want to answer this question? Yeah, because I'm the one with absolute nothing, no knowledge about programming. Um, and I'm doing quite okay, I would say. So um I think. The answer to your question is that you don't really need a strong programming background, although having some knowledge um, would help and it would help your, your team when you're communicating with them. Um, but then, of course, like uh, the, the thing about being in this field is that it is very strong on collaboration and you will be constantly working with people who are experts and specialized in their field. So it's more about being um, knowing how to collaborate rather than having every single skill in your back pocket. So I think that's the first part. And then I think there is a second part around um, 
um, are we able to apply for a UI UX job? I think so long as there are skills that you currently have, especially after your diploma, um, that you can apply to the UI UX field, depending on whether you are more interested in the research part, um, the design part, or um, the front-end development part. Like It really depends on where your interests are and your strengths are. But I think that will be value um, that you can bring to the team. Yeah, I think that's all. If Shana wants to add to anything. I think you summed it up pretty, pretty nicely. I mean, for myself, when I joined, I also didn't have any technical background. So uh, it was a bit of a learning curve, but you can learn along the way. So I don't think it's an absolute prerequisite, although it, it might be helpful. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll just share a tiny bit. So I come from a background where I studied programming. It depends on the role you're applying for. I think if you're applying for the KP program, you will need to have programming background. But otherwise, in general, you will not need to have programming background doing UX in uh, GovTech. Okay, so I hope that answers Rio's question. Uh, the next question from is one. Uh, can you elaborate an example of whiteboarding challenge during an interview? So maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this because I think I'm the pioneer of the whiteboard challenge uh, for us in GovTech. We usually come up with whiteboard challenges that are related to the projects they were coming up with or the projects they were doing, uh, but they won't seem like the same. Now we'll create some sort of like a relevant project. So for example, we... Uh, Shane and I both work on the grants portal. Uh, we come up with projects. They may seem very similar to how um, people make use of grants. I won't tell you what it is <laughs> because we still need to use these whiteboard challenges. So that's kind of the idea of what it's like. I hope that's helpful to answer the question. Um, a little bit more about whiteboarding is usually kind of like a, a session where you go through your end-to-end -end, uh, UX process within like one hour. So you talk us through your plan, what you plan to do, um, how you really want to like create a solution for it and what's a basic solution that you actually use. Uh. The next question from Kelly, uh, any advice for me careers which is interested in UI and UX design? Okay, so to share, right? I think many people, uh, when you submitted your, your signups to us, right, asked very similar questions around this. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Tini want to answer this first and then we'll add on. Okay, sure. Um, I think this really, like I have worked with a lot of career teachers when I was teaching um, UI UX. So I think the idea around trying to move from, um, because I think you, you come from an archie field, right? There are a lot of transferable um, skills that you can actually bring into the UI UX space. And um, that is often what I tell people who are trying to do a career switch. Um, for example, even if you come from a psych background, sociology background, it's all sort of like, it, it depends on what you're able to pull out um, from from your toolkit and your knowledge and your strengths um, and be able to apply it to this space. So I think, yeah, I think if you are, you are from the Aki field, I think there are also um, similar processes and similar skill sets that you can definitely apply. But I think a lot of um, um, students and career switchers usually just need that little bit of guidance in like what exactly are the transferable skills. Yeah, anyone wants to add to what I just mentioned as well? There's actually a second part about the pay scale. I don't think we can answer that. <laughs> yeah, I think we can just add that uh, GovTech pays competitively. Of course, we are not the market leader in paying our salaries to our employees, but we do have benchmarking in terms of salary so that we will always keep our um, employees like, paid competitively. La. We'll, do, we'll do annual review so that uh, we make sure our employees are well taken care of. Okay. I think Sonia has a question around what university majors do you think will be helpful in UX? Shana, do you want to answer this question? Uh, yeah, sure. So I think majors that definitely are directly helpful would be any field in design, right? Like product design, communication design, um, visual design sometimes. I mean, we have people coming from all sorts of design backgrounds, but also um, non-design fields and related fields like uh, information systems like Derek. In our team, uh, one of our other UX designers also has a background in psychology. There are people with a background in sociology. So yeah, <laughs> I would say um, we have a whole range of people from different backgrounds here. 
By the way, just to share a little bit, we hire for quite a few types of UX designers as well. So it's not, okay, generally, most of us are like this so-called generic or general UX designers, but there's also like UX researchers, uh, writers, interaction designers, uh, um, service designers. Yeah, we do have very specific skill sets, although most people are expected to do more than that particular field that they specialize in. Uh, and we do have many other teammates uh, who come from all sorts of places. What majors will be most helpful would definitely be the ones that Shina will have mentioned. Like if you've already studied design, great. There's also some business modules that are related to design. Uh, I think in SMU, it's under strategy or something like that. Um, certain marketing uh, majors are so helpful when it comes to UX design. It's not directly transferable, but I think there are things you learn that are helpful there. Uh, so we definitely have a lot of people who come from like psychology background as well, architecture background as well. Um, so they're not the most common. In fact, I think the percentage of people who have design background in GovTech as who are currently UX designers, right? Probably only like 20 to 30% actually have design backgrounds. Huh? So any major that you're interested in, that you can find a way to marry the skill with design would actually end up being a, a major that's helpful for you in UX. Huh? So I hope that answers the question. Okay, next question. I think Shayla asks about like first step to getting into UX and UI for someone coming from marketing and communications. Uh, so maybe the best way to look at it is just to start doing UX projects. So you can come up with imaginary projects. La. As long as you find something that's interesting for you to do as a UX project, I think that that kind of imaginary project will be helpful if you come from a background where you feel like it's not really related to design directly. Next question from Peter. Can you share about the internship program again, please? How to apply for that if there's a QR code? I think we will have something around that later, but I don't know if Kelly, you want to uh, give uh, a bit more information. Yeah, so uh, Charlene helped to send out the different GoGov links on uh, the different pages you can visit. So there's the internship opportunity one over there. Um, in terms of the internship program, I could share a bit more about how we how we are running it right now. So when you apply um, through uh, the career at GAF, we'll actually... After you are being shortlisted by HR, we'll send you an email for you to choose your top three selected um, choice of projects. So uh, there's a list of uh, like 100 over projects that you can look at and just pick the top three that you're keen in. So we'll float your profiles to the top two choices first for the reporting officers or the hiring managers to, to see if they want to shortlist you for, for um, interviews or for tech assessment tests. Yeah, so after they shortlist you, um, if there is a coding test or a take-home test, then you'll proceed to do those tests and then follow up by a uh, tech interview with the hiring managers. And then after, um, if you're successful in all the tests, you'll get an offer. Yeah, so if, if you are really good and you get offered by the two roles that you are co-currently exploring, you can actually get to choose which role you, you feel um, better match your interests. Yeah, so that's generally how the application is run. Uh, Peter, if you have further questions, you can let me know in the chat. Okay, another question from Jin Wei. The Skaftec hire for mid-career switchers who wish to transition to UX but have no previous working experience in UX. Uh, Shana, do you want to answer this question? Okay. I, I don't think when we hire, we look at absolute uh, experience, like absolute number of years of experience, but rather we look at a portfolio and the quality of your problem solving abilities i mean there are people with no working experience but have went to learn about ux on their own practice or maybe even done internships and from these uh little case studies we'll be able to to tell what kind of problem solver you are how you approach these things and i think that's more important uh, yeah okay but i think to add a little bit more from my side around this particular question we do Ooh, there are quite a few people who are actually mid career switchers with no previous working experience, but it's not the most common. Uh, yeah, I would say that they, they are really, really good. That's why they get hired. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Hui Xuan asks, are there 
any advice on building up your UI UX portfolios, like a list of projects that we could design for? Mm, Timmy, do you think you could answer this question? <laughs> oh, sure, I can. Um, I think there are definite, as in there is a way to be strategic about it. And I think my advice is always to work on projects that you are most passionate about. So, for example, if your um if your heart is it with um helping the elderly, or if your help if your heart is like with helping students, um then that gives you a good idea on what kind of projects you should sort of focus on, um what kind of problems should you sort of uh, uh research further into and try to solve for, um and that would actually give you maybe like a, a closer match to the kind of work that you might apply for and get as well. It's, it's kind of like a um almost like giving yourself a head start to an industry or a sector that you're very passionate about. Um, not saying that you would always get a perfect fit um, because sometimes like projects are simply just not hiring. Um, so sometimes it's just about building up that MO, building up that portfolio so that when the opportunity comes, um, you can give it your best shot. Yeah. If I could just add on to what uh, Timmy said. I think try to solve a, a real problem rather than just do a case study or, or redesign of something existing because sometimes you don't always have the full context to why certain decisions are made. But if you go into a problem space and uncover the problems yourself, you'll be able to have, I guess, uh, more depth <laughs> and a better explanation of why you're doing certain things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question from Renee. Uh, I was wondering what's the most challenging part about being a UX designer? I think uh, both Timmy and Shina should help to answer this question. Lah. Okay, from their experiences. Maybe Timmy will go first? Well, this is always like uh, quite, quite a tough question to answer because it's not so much about like the fact that we have no challenges, but what is the most challenging? I think that's quite difficult to answer. But I would say that Maybe um I think Shayna's presentation hinted to, to this, right? The idea that sometimes you do have to um like even though our heart is with helping um understanding the user needs and um wanting to solve for the problems in the perfect way, but this actually doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in your school projects, it doesn't exist in your in your um the case studies that you create for the portfolio, and it doesn't exist in real life in the industry either. Um very often the challenge is really around trying to find a middle ground. Um, in terms of like feasibility and in terms of trying to answer for um, the goals of your stakeholders, as well as understanding um, what is feasible um, within the budget and the time, what is the best middle ground for within the, the current constraints that you work in. So I think usually for designers who really put your heart and soul, um, like your design outcomes really like your baby, um, sometimes it's a little bit tough to see it um, being uh, stripped away or seeing it take a different form um, because of these constraints. But I think in a way, um, that's one of the challenges that make products um, succeed, that they cannot all be what you want. Uh, sometimes it's around um, finding middle grounds and, and making the best, um, the best fit at the best time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I resonate a lot with what Timmy shared. It's, it's true that um, sometimes these business and technical limitations um, are challenging to work around. And it's about thinking about how you can approach the problem in a creative manner, right? Um, and work within these constraints and still come up with something that is a good enough user experience. Of course, you still need to advocate for <laughs> a certain baseline, right? And not rack up too much UX debt. But all of this is a negotiation also and being able to understand where other parties are coming from. Um, another challenge is probably also stakeholder management. So sometimes we work in different ways and I think that's largely why in our team, we always try to start uh, a new project by inducting our stakeholders into the way we work so that they're familiar with our process and yeah, it makes for a better um, relationship. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Grace has a question where she mentioned about Timmy talking about different parts where one can specialize in such as research development, etc. So she mentioned that she's currently taking a programming and game design degree and if it's accepted, whether she is able to select what she wants to specialize in and uh, what should she be recommended to focus on development. Okay, wait, Timmy, do you want to answer this question to... <laughs> I want. can do a quick one, but I feel that you're a better fit to answer this question. Yeah, I, um, I feel like I should answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you yeah, can go for nice. it. <laughs> okay, you definitely can specialize in whatever. Um, okay, this, this is the answer to the greatest question, right? You can definitely specialize in whatever you want to specialize in, right? 
as long as you figure out how to apply it back to UX work. Lah. And I would not say that you should be recommended to focus on development, but it's definitely very helpful, right? Okay, so coming from a development background, being a UX designer in GovTech and working with developers, right, really helps me a lot because I understand what they're thinking, I understand what they want to do, and I also know what are the limitations or slightly um, what could work, what could not work even before I talk to them. Of course, it doesn't mean that I don't talk to them, but it helps a lot in the way you think because development stuff tends to give you a very uh, logical way to get things done. Uh. UX design itself has a slightly different approach to solving problems, but when you figure out how to combine them both together, right, it makes you very, very good at figuring out how to work with all the different kinds of people who are in the development team. Uh. Yeah. Do you really need to focus on it? I would say no, but it's helpful to learn. That's all I can say. Lah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Uh, another question from Jess. Any advice for mid-career switchers from another government agency like teacher at MOE with some UX experience? Why I have to start at an entry-level pace skill? Okay, I think I should answer this question again. I think the first question to answer is why I have to start at an entry-level pace skill? Um, I don't really know. We, we don't actually ask for your previous salary range. We just benchmark you against what's your current ability. So if we figure out that based on your experiences and what you can do, you are of a particular grading, um, you'll probably get that uh, pay scale. Uh. The other thing is I don't know what is the pay scale at MOE, so it's very hard to answer this question. Um, your entry-level pay scale differs across industries. Uh. So I don't really know what's the, what's the best answer for this. Then um, advice for the mid-career switching from government agency to another uh, government agency, right? I don't think it actually differs much from any other like mid career switching. Uh. You can be from a private uh, company or that kind of industry, right? And coming to the public sector. Um, end of the day, if you're starting something new, you have to figure out what is the most transferable skills you have from wherever you come from. Uh, and that's the most important thing. Uh. Okay. I always say that. In UX, right, the idea is you need to figure out how to solve problems and the value that you have, right, is the size of the problem you can solve. So UX designers' roles, right, mostly revolves around solving problems. And at the same time, the better you are at solving problems, the bigger problems you can solve, your salary also changes along, changes along with that. Lah. Um, so my advice would be to figure out how you can convert whatever you have to problem-solving skills. Lah. Uh, sounds a little bit fluffy, but I feel that this is a very accurate representation of what it is. Uh, I find that my job is all revolving around solving all sorts of different problems. That's all. Yeah. Uh, I think this one has another question. Can you share with us some of the challenges or frustrations you face uniquely in government agencies that you don't face in private sector? Uh, I think this is best for Timmy to answer. Lah. <laughs> And when you were going down the list, I was like, oh, this is the hardest question to answer. <laughs> um, because I have to air a bit of uh, things that I shouldn't be airing on this level. <laughs> no, but to be very, very honest, um, I feel that uh, for this particular project that I've been on, I've been incredibly lucky to be working with um, like a stakeholder, uh, like a few stakeholders that really understand and believe in the design process and really understand the value of research, um, doing proper user research before building products. Um, but I know that for some other teams and other members in GovTech that I've talked to, um, one of the, the greatest frustration is really advocacy, um, helping them understand how the process is um, and the kind of resources it takes to properly run it. Whereas, like, for example, if you are working in a consultancy or in an agency, the clients that are already paying you already believe in the process. So you sort of of like filtered out all the all the um, um for one it's hard to get the jobs right but then once you get the jobs um you have clients who are willing to educate themselves from the way that you do things whereas i think uh within the government sometimes you might work with uh, organizations or ministries or stakeholders um that do not fully understand it and like bulk of the work becomes um trying to help them understand it uh but again like i mentioned uh i really think that um moe has especially um, the team that we've been working with, it's almost like it's, it's seamless. Like there's no need to help them understand why, um, but it's just about like, so that we can actually put 100% of the work in actually doing, doing the actual work. Lah. So I think that's the, the part that is quite a blessing. 
yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just add on to what Cindy shared. Um, I think uh, another challenge that we face also is recruitment for research. Um, so we, we know that research and testing is important, right? But uh, a constraint that we face is also because that we're in the public sector, we don't really have these huge monetary incentives to recruit people for research. And it's not as easy as calling a recruitment firm and getting the exact sample of participants that you need. So for us, we need to be a bit creative about it. Um, and how we do it on our team is that we work very closely with our stakeholders to do this recruitment because they are the ones working closest to the people that we want to speak to. And here's where advocacy is also important because they see the value of this research that we are trying to do and they go the extra mile to help us to recruit the people that we want to talk to. Yeah. Let me just continue. Uh, Huilin asked a question. Uh, adding on to the question for mid-career switch, what are some of the hard skills GovTech is looking for when employing UX designers? Okay, I think I'll answer this question quickly. We make sure that you at least know all the end-to-end -end skills required for UX designer. So at least you are able to handle yourself when it comes to like doing research, when it comes to like ideation, uh, design solutioning, uh, coming out of all the documentation required when you're passing on uh, work to another person. Yeah, I, I would say that most of it has to do with the end-to-end -end UX process. Uh. I would say also the more important things are soft skills or right? hard skills if that helps. Uh, we don't say that, oh, you need to have programming skills. We don't say that you need to have Photoshop skills, but you should be able to learn to learn or learn to be able to pick up stuff easily, which is more important uh, because end of the day, you'll be put on projects whereby <laughs> you probably don't have a prior experience in that particular industry or you probably wouldn't have uh, used a particular tool before. Uh, so the ability, I'll see the soft skill and ability to learn to learn is the most important thing for UX designer in GovTech itself. Okay, so I move on to Sam's question. Uh, for career switches with transferable skills but lacks a portfolio in UI and UX design, is it a necessity for being shortlisted, shortlisted for interviews? The short answer is yes, I still think I will go deeper into it because Without a portfolio, we don't really know what you can do. And everybody else would have a portfolio. Now. I think the thing that you are worried about is where you, where you can figure out how to create a portfolio, which I think throughout um, the questions that we have answered, I think the main thing that comes up is you need to come up with your own projects or figure out a project for yourself to do. It doesn't necessarily have to come from somebody or doesn't necessarily have to come from a a client or stakeholder it can be something that you think you're very passionate about for example like you want to create a dog airbnb just an example okay and then okay uh we have about a few minutes left i see a question around whether the internship program is only open for students maybe kelly you want to answer this um yeah it's open for students and for uh students who are like in, in transition, like for instance, you finish your um, A-levels or your um, diploma and you're waiting to go for university. So during that break, you can also apply for internship. Yeah, we also have internship program for postgraduate students. So uh, that also works if you uh, are studying postgraduates. Okay, so we have like two minutes left. Okay, uh, I saw two more questions which are related to service design, uh, which I'll get Shana to answer. Okay, so a little bit loaded, but how is service designer different from UX designer in terms of job scope? Any special skills required? And is the service designer in the same development team? Okay, so Shana, please uh, answer that last question. <laughs> uh, okay, the main difference between UX and service design is fundamentally the scope and the nature of problem that um, you want to solve, right? So UX focus on solving problems uh, confined to a product or an individual touch point within a service. Whereas for service design, uh, it focuses more at a system level across silos and across individual touch points. So in terms of special skills, I guess the ability to think with a system level perspective, understand how things are interconnected and how they affect one another is quite important in service design. Um, UX designers consider this, um, but within uh, the scope of the product. Lah. And I guess I can also answer Hui Shen's question 
about uh, whether or not service designers sit in the same development team. Uh, I would say within uh, our division, yes, uh, we do. Um, because I think a lot of the products that we work on also require us to be able to understand things beyond just the product. Like, for example, when we're working on a grant system, we also need to understand uh, other things that come into play and uh, things that affect it on a policy level, things that people do on the ground outside of the system. So, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, actually, I think we can answer a few more questions. Okay, this is from Elaine. How the design processes that were shared, like research, workshops, what's your favorite part as UX designers? For those who study UX design in school, how different is the content covered in school and working as a professional UX designer? Okay, maybe Timmy, you want to share first? Okay, oh, sure. Favorite part as UX designers. So this is a very personal perspective, right? I think for me, um, even though I am more of an interaction designer, I always feel that the part that energizes me the most as a person is actually the research part. Because um, that's usually the part where you have like face-to-face -face, um, contact with the very people that you're designing for. And I think um, as a designer, it does fill your heart with the purpose. Lah. Like um, eventually when things get difficult or when things um, become challenging, you can always go back um, to that moment where you sort of understand whose problem you're trying to solve, um, what issues you're trying to solve. So I think that's the part that really gives me the most joy. Um, but I think for a lot of designers, it's really very different. So that's sort of um, just my personal preference. Uh, then I think the second part is around uh, for those who studied UX design in school, how is it different from the content covered? Um, I do struggle a little bit um, with this when I am trying to teach UIUX because the thing about how um, the in industry really functions is always slightly different um, technically and conceptually and um, theoretically they are quite similar in terms of like trying to help you understand the double diamond um, the design thinking process etc but then when you are actually doing it um, in the industry right uh, there are always it's a lot less sequential and it's a lot more messy um, that it tends to than it tends to be in school. So that is the part where a lot of like students, when they are either working with real clients for the first time or when they enter the industry for the first time, they are usually a bit shocked by it. But then, like if you fundamentally understand what design thinking, um, the framework is created for, um, you are able to sort of understand uh, like when you diverge, when you converge, and things like that. So I think theoretically, it's quite the same. But then in terms of application, it it does um differ from project to project. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll just, because in interest of time, right, um, I'll just quickly close off this question from Elaine or Sola. Actually, I would have answered pretty much the same thing as Timmy, uh, at least for the part about um, how is it different from in school and being a UX designer. Lah. I think when you actually do real work as a UX designer, you will see that the stuff they do in school is very idealistic. The realistic stuff that you do, right? You realize, oh, there's also this to think about. There's also that to think about. I always give an example of when we create and design a login flow, right? It sounds very simple to do on surface, right? But actually go into details and try to have that flow created, you realize that there's a lot of things that go behind it, such as like making sure that there's error messages, making sure that different people are linking to diff when you log in with a different user role, you're linked to a different user type interface etc etc uh, and then I guess for me my favorite part as UX designer or my favorite design process as UX designer is really more of like usability testing when I actually see people get to use the stuff that I do and they enjoy using it and figure out how to use it uh, I feel that that's kind of an achievement for me yeah okay so there's many other questions that we can answer. I'm sorry that we cannot answer all of them, but we'll try to see if we can still leave some of our answers in the chat. Okay, we'll close off this session only at 1.30. Uh, but I want to go on to show a little bit more about uh, certain other things. Okay, so before everybody starts to leave the chat, right? Okay, um, maybe let's stay in touch, okay? And if you want to stay connected with us, right, you can follow us on our social media channels. Now. So there are a few QR codes here which you can uh, just like, what do you call this, uh, scan and go into. 
if you want, if you want to know more about our latest updates, right, you can subscribe to our talent community as well, which is the second uh, QR code. And if you're looking for some of the roles that we flashed earlier, uh, it's actually in the third QR code. Lah. All right. So we'll just leave this here and I'll continue to try to answer the remaining questions they have on chat. Lah. Okay. Yeah.